In the John, the first first chapter of the epistle, John, and we, we want you to understand this was not John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the one that God prepared to come and prepare Israel for the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. We've taught for quite a while, maybe almost a year, on the book of Matthew. And how that Matthew uh, presented the gospel to us and gave record to the time when Jesus came and presented the kingdom of heaven to the house of Israel. And how that they rejected it. And how that we don't preach the kingdom of heaven right now, we preach the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ will come back in, the, in his part of the second coming and we will know about the kingdom of heaven when it comes down. Jesus Christ will judge. The words that he says from his own mouth like a sword will judge and finish it all. He'll put an end to sin. Sin has already been conquered. Jesus Christ is the one that will destroy sin. Daniel prophesied. God caused him to, to reveal unto us the 70 weeks of prophecy. But he came down to this conclusion that during this special time, in the 70th week, which we've not got there, we've lived through 69 weeks. That ended when Jesus was crucified. And the reason God told Daniel to close it up is because God had a different plan that he wouldn't allow Daniel to see. Nobody could see it, but God wanted a time of grace. He brought in between the 69th week and the 70th week, and the 70th week is soon to begin. We're in the time of grace, a time when the prophets desired to look into it, but they couldn't see it. And God revealed to Daniel, but told Daniel to close up the book. Well, let me tell you, friend, we've lived in the time of grace. God opened the church up to the Gentile people, and today we're saved because of Jesus Christ. Today we have access to a holy God through Jesus and his finished work on Calvary. Brother Roy, it wouldn't have made no difference if Jesus would have came and done the miracles he did and just died. But our Jesus is the only one that ever came that conquered death. He paid the price for sin and he never only paid the price for sin, but he's going to come back and he'll finish sin. There'll be a time of great tribulation like the world has never known. And we're going to get into this. I've held back on starting it till I could see what was my plan in trying to get through this cancer. But after we get through that, God willing, we will start the study of the book of Revelation. A lot of things have changed since I taught it the last time. We're in a new time and we've seen new things. And I'll tell you what, children, my eyes are more open to the very near coming of Jesus Christ than they, they've ever been. God has shown us some things. And I'll tell you what, you need to be praying for me, but you need to keep your eyes open. In the third chapter of John, by the help of the Lord, we're going to bring a message this morning. In the third chapter, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm just going to start reading from the third verse of the third chapter of the first epistle of John. This was the beloved. This was the one that wrote the gospel of St. John. This is the one that God gave the messages to the church there through the three epistles, first, second, and third John. And this is the same John that God, after they had cast him out on the Isle of Patmos to punish and to get rid of him, God preserved him and gave him the revelation of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. But here in this third chapter of the book of John, it says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, 
even as he is pure. How many of you love each other? Give me a little test. The Bible says pure and undefiled religion is to visit the fatherless, the orphans in their affliction and the widows, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. How many of you understand that as a Christian, you're supposed to be different? How many of you understand that some people say, well, my little sin won't hurt nobody. It's not going to affect nobody. Well, God don't care about that. Let me tell you, there is no sin that God hasn't had to pay for. All sin makes guilty before God. All sin must be paid for. All sin has a penalty. You say, well, I don't do that big a sin. Uh, maybe I sin every now and then. Let me tell you something. Sin is sin, period. There are no big sins and little sins. There's some that hurt more. There's some that have a bigger impact on people and upon families and upon things. And maybe we've all been guilty of some of those. But let me tell you, sin is sin. And sin is a transgression of the law. It says here, every man that hath this hope in him, and that's the hope of Jesus Christ, he purifieth himself even as Jesus is pure. Whosoever committeth sin, now listen to this. It's very powerful and very point blank. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Do you see how important it is that you know the Word of God? You know, there's some Christians that hardly ever pick up the Bible and read to understand what God's Word is. And there's some people that use the excuse, well, I just can't understand it. No, and you never will till you get into it. The more you read, the more you'll know. The more God will reveal to you. The more that you read and the more you seek God, the more God will enlarge your heart and capacity to understand deeper things of God. That's why he said to desire the sincere milk of the Word. He understands you maybe have just got saved or maybe you just can't eat the big steak spiritually speaking, that some can eat because they've grown in the Lord to where they understand and they, they're not satisfied on the milk of the Word anymore, but they've grown and they desire and they get to where they can handle the deeper things of God. Well, it says here that whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. How many of you understand the law? How many of you understand what the law is? The Bible says that the law came by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You see, under the law, it was what God required to set his children apart from the heathenistic sinful world that they lived in. And God gave the commandments to Moses. But there were many more commandments besides the Ten Commandments that God gave to His people. But it caused His people to be separate and different. And you say, well, that was the law. Yes, it was. But it spoke of a holy God. And God did not destroy the law. So don't let this bunch today that's preaching this tell you that God done away with anything because God never done away with any of his righteousness nor holiness we're under grace but it doesn't give you the ability nor the right nor the privilege to sin a little bit you sin when you transgress the law of God if you don't know the law of God you need to learn it if you want to know it God will show it to you Brother Ernie, the law of God is very simple and very plain. Under the law, it was thou shalt not do this, 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 this. God never done away with that. But God opened a door of grace and brought a new people in. The Gentile people, we were not of the, uh, the chosen family of God. But by faith today, we become 
an heir through the seed of David and through the promise that God gave Abraham, God had an earthly people. God gave them earthly promises. The children of Israel, they wandered around. They went into the promised land. They sinned. God scattered them. But today, and after a long period of silence, God revealed to them the kingdom of heaven. And Matthew gave us record of that. But Jesus added to that. And Jesus kept adding and the Pharisees kept seeking. And uh, Brother Randy and I, we've, we've kind of been talking about a little scripture to where the Pharisees were questioning the Lord and seeking after God. You know, they were all, always trying to trap Him and always trying to expose Him and always after Him to kill Him. But He told them, He said, after you know you can't plead ignorant. We can't take a chance on facing God one day and saying, Lord, I just didn't know. No, sir. The gospel has went out all over the world. The gospel is stronger right here in the Bible Belt than anywhere else in the world. If you're ignorant towards God and His Word, it's your own fault. I'm not trying to preach this this morning as a radical. I just want you to understand the seriousness of being a Christian. I want you to understand that you are the light of the world. I want you to understand that your life shouldn't be filled with sin like the world has or like unruly Christians have. You see, there's some people today, I don't doubt that they've been saved. I know probably that many of them have been saved but they just have heard false doctrine after false doctrine and they've compromised on the truths of what God said that we should be and they've come to the place to where they think, well, I can't do no better, nobody else does any better and all of us are just like, kind of like we were when we were sinners and it's okay and God has accepted that. No, God hasn't. The scriptures here that I want to read to you says, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, speaking of Christ. After he said that whosoever committeth sin transgresseth the law. For the sin is the transgression of the law. What law? The law of Moses, the law of God. You see, Moses didn't just dream this up. This was God's law. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. How many of you are part of God's family? Come on, raise your hands up there. Say amen. amen. Okay. Whosoever abideth in him, if you want to abide in the family of God, if you want to be a part, is what he's saying, of the family of God, you sin not. And whosoever sinneth hath not seen him neither known him. What's he saying? If you step outside of faith and you start living like the devil again. The Bible says in another portion that Apostle Paul said that it would have been a better for you not to have known the way than after you have known the way and tasted of God. He said it would have been better off for you not because you become more guilty than ever. And in the scriptures there, in uh, one portion, it says that uh, if we know the way, and then we willfully choose to sin, he said, wherefore, he said we ought to lay, a, lay aside every weight. Is there something in your life that tempts you more or drags you down or causes you maybe not to be the shining light you should be for Christ? He said you need to lay that aside. Get rid of it. Lay, away, lay aside the, the weight and the sin that doth so easily beset you. And run with patience the race that is set before you. Looking unto Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You may have to endure the cross a little bit. You may have to suffer a little bit. And he despised the shame. Let me tell you something. 
It says here, I want you to read on down with me. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Don't let the devil take control of your life. If you're a Christian, live like a Christian. If you're a Christian, live like Jesus wants you to live. Are we perfect? You'll never be. But your heart's desire ought to be a changed desire from when you were walking in sin. When you were in sin, you obeyed the lust of the flesh. The Bible says in James there, in the first chapter, in the 15th verse, that first you have lust. In other words, God made you to where you can desire whatever you want. God made you like Him. You're not a, a bunch of angels that God directs, or you're not something that God created that you have no choice in matters. God made you like Him. He wanted you to want to love Him and talk with Him and commune with Him. We haven't seen Him yet, but one day we will. But God wants us to talk with Him and to love Him. That's why God made us. God made us in His own image. But because of that, the devil at war with God, where he rose up against God and God cast him and a third part of the angels out and reserved in the chains of hell those angels that departed with him. But we know that one day God will finish sin. Sin is our problem. Don't let it become a problem in your Christian walk. Deal with it. Resist the devil. If the devil's trying to get you to do something wrong and you know it, stay away from it. It says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's why Jesus came was for you to conquer sin and to destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit, commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And we're speaking there that if you're a child of God, you should not ever get to the place to where you think it's okay to go ahead and start sinning again. That's not of God. And it puts you on the devil's side. You need to be like Jesus. The Bible says in the fifth chapter of the book of Romans, if you want to take that scripture down, you can read a letter, but it says that the law of Moses was our schoolmaster. You say, how can I know what I'm supposed to do? Let me tell you, children, God has not laid down a plan that's real complicated. It's very clear. I want you to turn with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter. And I want to read you a few scriptures because this was God speaking to His people. This was during the time of Moses when God set down what He wanted them to know and to understand. Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Pentateuch. What is the Pentateuch? The Pentateuch are the five books that God let Moses author. Moses was the one that God chose to lead his children out of bondage. In the twelfth verse of the tenth chapter it says, And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? You say, what, what does God want from me? Well, this is what he wanted for his family when he chose them out of a sinful world he said what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in all of his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. That's what God wanted. That's what God still wants. 
the two great commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, strength, and might. And love your neighbor as yourself. You see, and I've heard some, and I've had some come to me, and as a pastor and as a preacher, many times I've had people come to question me over things, what's right, what's wrong. But this little family right here, let the Holy Spirit speak to you just a minute. We're the church. We're brothers and sisters. Brother Ernie, you're my brother. Now the devil would like for me to get with Sister Linda and say, you know how honorary that brother Ernie is. Have you heard of some of the things that Brother Neal's done? Have you seen how Brother Dale treats Tony? Yeah. And then you go to communicating and talking about that. How many of you think that's right? If I come to you, Brother Neil, and start talking about Brother Randy, you ought to say, hey, I just soon not talk about that. But why? Because you love Brother Randy. Amen. Amen. You sisters need to put the nip on it if any of the women ever get to talking. And you brothers need to put it and seal it up if brothers go to talking. Because we're God's children. You don't do that. That's what he's speaking of here. You've got to love God. You've got to love his family. You've got to love his children. And you love each other. And if I love you, I shouldn't be talking about you. If I find out you've done something wrong or maybe somebody's accused you of something wrong, I ought to pray for you, not talk about you. Amen. That's what God wants. God wants us to love Him. It said, Behold the heaven and the heaven of heavens. It is the Lord thy God. And the earth also, that belongs to God. And all that is therein. Only the Lord had a delight in the fathers to love them. And he chose their seed after them. God chose us. We didn't choose him. God opened the door of grace. We didn't open that. We didn't come in as intruders. We came in because we were so blessed. And God said, I'll give my son to die for your sins. And give you the rite of passage into the family of God. Circumcise, this is the key right here. Circumcise, let God do the operation on your heart. Therefore, the foreskin of your heart. We all understand what circumcision is in real life. And we all know the covenant that God made with Israel. And that was that every man child before he was eight days old, he had to go and have the foreskin of his body removed so that the world would always know that this was one of God's children. Well, spiritually speaking, God wants us to have an operation in our heart. Every child of God. You need to let God do it because if you try to do it, you'll fail. You can't get yourself straightened up like God wants you, but God can. Sin has a way of hurting. But God wanted to make us different. Said, for the Lord your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty God, and a terrible God, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. In other words, you can't buy your way in. You can't do enough to earn your way in. But God loves you because he loves you. You're his because he chose you. And if you're one of his... You can't go on living in sin. I want you to turn to Micah, the sixth chapter. Turn to Micah, the sixth chapter. I want you to read something here. In the sixth verse, it says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Forget about your neighbor, just kind of as we're reading this right here, just understand that it's you and God, because that's the way it is. 
Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? You know, that's what the Lord wanted for the perfect sacrifice was a, 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 a lamb or a calf or whatever of the first year. He didn't want the old and the sick and the, what was left over and what was about to die. He wanted the very best that his people had. But it said here, is that what God wants me to do? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? I'll just bring a bunch more sacrifices than my brother or sister does because I've got a lot to give and I'll give God a whole bunch and God will be pleased with me. That don't persuade God. Or with ten thousands of rivers of oil, you couldn't bring enough anointing oil. You couldn't bring enough special gifts you know, they got on to the Lord because this one little woman took this very expensive oil and anointed our Lord. You see, God owns it all. It's all His, Brother Ernie. It's all God's. But He said, Shall I bring rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn, Brother Ernie, what if you had to take your firstborn child and give it to God to ever please Him? Brother Dale, that'd be a hard gift, wouldn't it? You know, that's what it appeared to be taking place whenever Abraham standing at the bottom of the mountain and looking up there and knowing what was going to happen and God told him to bring his son up there and his son was bearing the wood that he would lay him upon. But God didn't want Isaac. God prepared something else. But what if you had to give your firstborn to please God? Be hard, wouldn't it? Be hard. The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. That'd be a tough question to answer, wouldn't it? Brother Randy, I don't know if I could have ever been one of God's children if I'd have had to give my oldest son that just passed away. I, I don't know, Sister Nikki, if I could have done that. Probably couldn't have. But he has showed thee. Now, this is what the writer is wanting you to understand. Oh man, what is good? And what doth the Lord require of thee? but to do justly. He just wants you to be right. That's all God wants. Be justly. Do right amongst your fellow brothers and sisters. Love mercy and walk humbly with thy God. That's what God wants. You know, when the John came preaching the kingdom of heaven. You know what his message was? Repent. The kingdom of heaven is here. Jesus has come to earth. Turn around from the way you've been living. Turn around to God. That's what he came preaching. Jesus, right after he began preaching and came preaching, and we know that they took old John and put him down in the jail cell because he stood up and preached against sin. He called out uh, Herod's brother Philip for having his brother's wife and, and caused, caused Herod to hate him and to come after him to slay him. But John came repentance. Time preaching repentance. Turn around from those kind of things. Turn around from the mean things, the ugly things, the things that hurt. If you want to know some of the, the, the sins, and we could go on and on and on here, but you can turn to Galatians 5th chapter and down to 17th verse, and you're going to hear a whole lot of them, and I won't take time to go over those. But there's a lot of sins. But sin is boiled up in this one little circle that you can say everything that's in that circle applies if it transgresses God's law, if it's not in love, if it's not just, if it's not merciful, then it's sin. 
the soul that sinneth in the book of Ezekiel, 18th chapter, I want you to turn with me. It says, The Lord, in the 18th chapter, the word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye? That ye use this proverbs concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. You know, from the beginning, when the law was given unto Moses, the Bible says that when they sinned, it, they were punished down to the fourth and fifth generation. But God said it right. God put it in order. And God said here, you've been using that old proverb for a long time. If you, your dad done bad, you're going to get punished. If you do wrong, your children are going to pay for your sins. But God said, as I live, saith the Lord, God, ye shall not have an occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. So let us make it and bring it right on down right here. Aaron, you'll not be responsible for your children after you get them raised. You're responsible to raise them. But that child, as hard as you try, he may go in the wrong way and sin. But you'll not be guilty of that. He'll pay for his own sin. Brother Randy, you've got boys. You've got children. It was your, responsible to, your responsibility to raise them. But after you raise them, they'll not pay for how ugly or bad you've been, and you won't pay for how ugly or bad they get. It says right here, As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have an occasion anymore to blame it on something else. Behold, all souls are mine. God put it right down real plain. Every one of you belong to him. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. You see, it's really important then for us to understand what it means to transgress the law of God. It's important for us to understand that none of us are going to get exempt. Our children are not going to pay our debt and we're not going to pay theirs. Every man's going to pay for his own sin. God has made provisions for our children till they come to the age of accountability. They don't know sin until they become to that age where they understand that they are guilty before God. Then they become accountable. After they become accountable, nobody pays for their sin but themselves. It says, but if any man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and on down in the ninth verse, and hath walked in my statutes and hath kept my judgments to deal truly, he is just and shall surely live, saith the Lord God. You know, I've got a message on my heart this morning that I probably if I preach till 6 o'clock this evening, I don't figure any of you is wanting to bless that long I'll never get through it. But in the book of Hebrews, and we'll not take time to read in there, but he says, if any man sin willfully after that he has received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Let me tell you, when God shows you and you walk away from it, there is no salvation outside of Jesus. You've got to do it God's way. All sin makes you guilty before God. All sin has to end up with something dying. In our case, Jesus has already died for our sins. As ugly as I've been in my life, and as ugly as some things make me sorry that I ever done it, I understand that God loved me enough that He sent Jesus. And Jesus died for me. Brother Aaron, it makes no difference how bad you've been. God loved you enough 
to give his son for your sins. Babe, it don't make no difference how much you've done ugly things in your life. It's about how great God loved you. And Abe and Randy and Neil and Dale and Ernie and me and just all you boys, it don't make no difference how we see things or how we want to deal with them. The end result is if it becomes sin, then we've got to do it God's way. And we've got to take the remedy that God offered us. You know, you may choose to sin. The Bible says, I would that you sin not. But if you sin, you have an advocate or an attorney. He's right there with God right now pleading your case. But if you decide to walk away from that, you decide to sin willfully, and you decide to walk in sin and not come to God with your sin, you'll end up in hell. That's where all sin will end up. Every sin will have to have something die for the guilt. That's why whenever everyone that came into the... And Brother, Brother uh, Randy is getting ready. He's working on something right now for the tabernacle and to show. And I, and I can't wait till he gets it finished and we all get to see. But that's why every one that came in the eastern gate, and there was just one way in, and today there's just one way in with your sin. You'll come in, and the first thing you've got to do is go to the altar. And let me tell you, you'll die and go to hell if you don't bring your sins to God and go through Jesus and accept the sacrifice that He made for you. But they, under the law, they had to come in and then they had to go up there to the priest and then they had to take their hands and lay on it. Even if it was a little turtle dove, they had to grab it by the head and confess their sins and say, you're going to pay for my debt. And the priest would take it and cut its head off. Or if it was a calf or if it was a lamb, he would kill it there on the brazen altar and the blood would flow. And that would be the cost of your sin. I'm just about to come to a close. The Bible says in the book of Timothy there that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Let me say to you here today, there are things in life that we can say God wants this or God wants that. It doesn't really make any difference how I interpret it or you interpret it. But it does come down to this. And this is the message I come to preach to you this morning. All sin will be required before God. All sin will have to be paid for or you'll not get into heaven. You say, I, I kind of wrote down some questions. What will keep me out of heaven? Ask yourself that question. It will be sin. What is sin? It's a transgression of what God said. In other words, if your parent tells you to do something and you don't do it, you get guilty before your parents. You understand that, don't you? Well, God has made it very plain and there's no excuse for ignorance. If it transgresses what God is, you see, the only righteousness we have is the what God gives us. And God won't look upon sin. God won't make an excuse for sin. God won't overlook sin and say, that's okay, you're a pretty good fellow, you can sin a little bit. No, it brings us all down guilty before God. And it makes us understand that if we don't confess it before God and take God's plan, then we'll never see heaven. What is the remedy for sin? There's just one. Somebody tell me. Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. That's your only remedy. You're going to have to come through Jesus by faith. You're going to have to accept His Word. You're going to have to accept His plan. 
you're going to have to confess Him as your Savior. And then you're going to have to live above sin. I love you. I wish I could just wrap my arms around you and say let's all go to heaven and we'll just have one prayer and then we'll leave. But it don't work that way. You've got to walk that you're going to walk to the last day of your life. You're going to take your journey and you're going to end somewhere. It'll all end. Every one of you, no make no difference how little, how young, how old you are. We don't know where the end of our journey is. I was up in the holla yesterday evening uh, talking with God and uh, had a very special time with God yesterday evening. And I was just wondering, God, how will my end come? Where will I be? You know, Brother Roy, we just don't know. We don't have that answer. I've been there with probably thousands of people as they died. I've held them. I remember a little boy that went to work one morning and I, I come up on him and he was in the middle of the highway. He had wrecked his car and he was dying. And I remember for three or four hours there, I just held him and loved on him. Couldn't get an ambulance. His blood was going out of him and his life was leaving him. And that's the way he died. I remember down here on Dixon Hill, I remember going down over the hillside there and a little woman about 60 or 70 years old, she was afraid, but she was dying. She wouldn't let the police, we got the police down there, we tried to get the police down there and the police wouldn't come, they were in a big poker game. They said they couldn't force her into an ambulance, the ambulance said we just can't do it, we can't make her. I said, we've got to get her to the hospital. She's died. I held her to life left her. You know, in the last year, we've seen more nightmare stories and heard more terrible things than we've ever heard in our lifetime. But somewhere down the road, Brother Ernie, you'll meet the Lord. You'll come to the end of your journey, Sister Lynetta. You gotta have it right. Sin will keep you out of heaven. You've gotta have your sins under the blood. There is but one remedy. I'd like to ask you to stand. If any of you have sin in your life this morning, I can't take you anywhere except to the place to where you'll call upon the Lord by faith. The only way you'll ever get your sins paid for is come through Jesus. The only way that you'll ever, ever reach Jesus is by faith. You've got to have faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. He that cometh to God must believe that He is. And that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So this morning I want you to search your heart. And I'd like to say to you this morning... There's nothing wrong with a Christian if they need to come and talk to the Lord. This is the house of prayer. It doesn't make you a bad Christian because you feel the drawing of the Holy Spirit and want to come and pray. That's what we're here for. That's why we love each other. We want to pray with each other. It's a great privilege to be able to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. If you have a need this morning, I want to ask you to slip out of your seat. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you, this morning, is there one of you that would like to come and have prayer? Is there one of you that has sins that need to be forgiven? Don't put it off. You may never make it home. Don't put it off. There may never be another Sunday. I'll tell you what the signs that's taking place in Israel and around the world and right here in our own land today tells me that the coming of the Lord is at hand. It's close. Get right. Don't play with sin. The devil will trick you. The devil will deceive you. If you need to pray, why don't you just slip out of your seat and come up here and this old preacher will get down with you and we'll talk to God about it. Is there one?
Is there an unsaved person here that would like to be saved? Would you like to choose Christ as your Savior? I know there are some here that need to make that choice. You might think you're young. You might think that you really can wait another Sunday or two or maybe another year or so to be saved because you're so young. Don't let the devil lie to you. Every little boy and every little girl don't get to grow up. Sometimes we reach the end of our journey early in life. This morning, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I'm going to ask you one more time if there's any that wants to come and pray. And I'm going to tell you that the message that I brought to you this morning is the problem we have all over our land and in all of our families, and that's the problem of sin. Sin is when you transgress God's will. If you're here this morning, you'd like to be saved, come. Is there any with an uplifted hand would say, Preacher, I'm not going to come and pray, but I'd like for the church to pray for me. Would you raise your hand and say, Brother Leston, pray for me. God bless you, honey. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, I love you so much. Anybody else? God bless you, honey. Bless your little heart. Somebody else. Our Heavenly Father, you know these hearts that are represented by these hands. God bless them. Lord, give them what they need. Lord, you said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. That's us. That's every one of us. Lord, we ask your blessings upon these five precious souls that have raised their hands. Lord, help them by faith to find what only you can give them. Bless us, Lord. Go with us. Supply the needs in our lives in the days ahead. Let us find your grace all sufficient. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody, just let everybody know you love each other. May God bless you. We'll see you, Lord willing, Thursday night. Do something.